I think guys are listening to this like the podcast because I'm not doing anything interesting. Hello everyone, today we're doing something a little bit different. If you're new here, my name is Kara. I talk a lot about Dominican culture, living in the DR, expat life, even random reviews of things. If you want to subscribe, that would be amazing. And if you're coming back, this is something I've never done before, but I plan to do it at least one more time, but hopefully more. Today we're doing a review of the book How the Garcia Girls Lost Their Accent by Julia Alvarez. She is a Dominican-American author. She was born in New York City, but then when she was very little, the family moved back to the DR, but then they were forced out again when she was 10 due to the Trujillo regime. Basically, this book touches a little bit on that history, but we'll get more into that later. Hi, editing Kara here. I just wanted to say I'm sorry. The next 15 minutes of the video are completely out of focus. I don't know what happened to my camera, but I was recording for 29 minutes out of focus, believe me, tears are shed. But I really did not want to go back and film it again, it was too late when I discovered this. And the next clip after that is in focus, so if you stay, I really appreciate that and I do advise that you keep my advice in the beginning and just listen to it as a podcast. Again, I'm so sorry, but I promise I'll try to be better in the future. Thank you so much for watching. I don't remember how exactly they found out about Julia Alvarez or these novels, but I do know that this book, How the Garcia Girls Lost Their Accent, and In the Time of the Butterflies, those two have been on my list of books I've wanted to read for at least a few months, if not a year or more. Seeing as they are written by a Dominican-American author, it definitely piqued my interest in them. Obviously, I love the DR, I live there most of the time, and my husband's Dominican. So I'm always excited to learn more about the culture, especially more about the history. I don't know a lot about Dominican history, I've heard bits and pieces there, trying to put the pieces together, but I'm always excited to learn more. I also got my degree in English language and literature, so this is kind of like a clash of both worlds, my two worlds coming together, reading books and my life in the Dominican Republic. I spent a lot of time reading in college, but even before that I was always reading as a kid. My dad even says, I know you're watching dad, so hi. <laughs> my dad even says that my parents found me reading the dictionary one time. And now it's just really cool to be able to talk about a book written by a Dominican American, which has become a pretty important part of my life, this little island country. <laughs> in case you didn't notice or you don't regularly watch my channel, I'm in my home setup because I am visiting family. And that's one of the reasons I was able to get my hands on this book. Don't come at me, but I don't even know if there is a library in San Juan Domingo. I'm sorry, I should do my research more, but someone let me know if there is a library in San Juan Domingo. But anyways, this is just one of the conveniences of being home. There is a library here. It's pretty close drive from my house. Actually, I have to say a huge thank you to my brother because I have been thinking I want to go to the library when I'm back and get back into reading physical books. But anyways, I didn't make it happen. And then my brother came home and he decided he was going to go one day. And I said, oh, let me go with you. And then I'm actually really glad that I decided to go with him and not on my own because I couldn't even find my library card. <laughs> so I ended up just using his. There were a lot of books I wanted to read or look for in the library. I just have a growing list that I just usually get off Amazon to read on my phone on the Kindle app. But it is a luxury to have a library and not to have to commit to paying money for books that I'm not sure that I will like or want to keep around. I mean, obviously it's all digital, but still, it takes up space. So that's how I got my hands on these books. I wanted to read a lot of like classic books, but a lot of them were just not available. People had already checked them out. And these two were available. So I ended up with a couple of books from Julia Alvarez one of which I will discuss today. Anyways, it's just really satisfying to be able to read like a physical book. I love flipping through pages, like that is a vice of mine. I just love doing it. I usually end up reading on the Kindle app on my phone, sometimes my laptop, but it's really nice to take a break from the screens because I'm staring at the screens for working and tutoring, so it's nice to just have a physical book. Also, I usually read, I don't want to say self-help books, but Christian books or books that I feel like are worth buying since I might want to reference them later or come back to them. Not that fiction books aren't like that, but they are more of a gamble. One Dominican book or book by a Dominican-American author that I have read is The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wilde by Juno Diaz. That one was kind of depressing, to be honest. I don't know if I'll do a review on that one. I didn't really plan on doing that when I read it. That was one of the ones sitting in my other apartment that I read, left behind by a former teacher. But if y'all want, I can try to revive my memory or read it again and do a review of that one. So to start, let me just read the back cover of this book to give you guys sort of a feel of it. I'm going to first give in some quick reactions that I had to the book, and then I'll give a more in-depth review. Then I'll share some of my favorite quotes. 
all these parts I will say don't need a spoiler alert for them and then there will be a part I go into later so I'll do some discussion questions because there are some at the back of this book that I thought would be interesting to talk a little bit on. I'm not gonna go crazy. This is not English class but if you want to be English class you can. I'll give you a spoiler alert when we're doing that because I think some of the questions do sort of spoil some parts but for now I'm just gonna read the back and do like some initial reactions and my initial review of the book to start. And then later I'll share your favorite quotes and then do the questions and conclude. To begin, let's read the back. Acclaimed writer Julia Alvarez's beloved first novel gives voice to four sisters as they grow up in two cultures. The Garcia sisters, Carla, Sandra, Yolanda, and Sofia, and their family must flee their home in the Dominican Republic after their father's role in an attempt to overthrow the brutal dictator Rafael Trujillo is discovered. They arrive in New York City in 1960 to a life far removed from their existence in the Caribbean. In the wondrous but not always welcoming USA, their parents try to hold on to their old ways as the girls try to find new lives by straightening their hair and wearing American fashions, and by forgetting their Spanish. For them, it is at once liberating and excruciating to be caught between the old world and the new. Here they tell their stories about being at home and not at home, in America. That's essentially the gist of the book. Now let me give you some quick right off the bat expectations and reactions I had to the book. First of all, to start, the novel works backwards in time. Chronologically, it goes in reverse. Second, this kind of means there's no really official beginning, middle, end. I mean, obviously there is to the story and she sort of works it in to have that, but it's not like a very traditional story. This follows the curve of a typical plot line. Third, keeping that in mind, it's almost like each chapter has its own individual short story and kind of each chapter has that typical bell curve of a plot with the conflict, the resolution, and the next one begins, sets the scene, has the same sort of bell curve. Fourth, I kind of wish I read In the Time of the Butterflies first before this one because I was looking at that one and I realized it was set before this one. They're not about the same characters, it's not a series, but I read this one first. I made the decision before that I would read this one first because it is her first published book. That's why I made that decision, but I am excited to read In the Time of the Butterflies. As I mentioned, I will do a review of that one. I heard it's good for learning a little bit more about life during the Trujillo era, during his dictatorship. So I'm excited to learn more about that kind of history because I know in the brief wondrous life of Oscar Wilde, they also mentioned that era in Dominican history. I am very curious about it. Let me get into more of an in-depth review of the book. The different chapters of the book have names, but they also have from whose perspective the story is. Now some of them has like the whole family and some of them have one of the sisters, whereas some of them have three or four of the family members. But the book starts out with a chapter from Yolanda's perspective, and it starts out when she's a fully grown adult, which surprised me at first. As I mentioned, the novel works backwards, but I didn't know this, so I was surprised. Because it's supposed to be a tale of how they, you know, got rid of their accent, how they got acclimated to life in the US. So I was confused why it was starting out in the Dominican Republic, where she was visiting after living in the US. I definitely feel like the book was mainly told from Yolanda's perspective, which other people have noted too. In the discussion questions, there's one that kind of touches on that. And I definitely feel like more personal details were shared about her character than the others. And honestly, as an oldest daughter myself, I was kind of waiting for more of the Carla chapters to see her perspective, her life, and things like that. But I never feel like we got really deep into her character. Maybe deeper into hers than the second or the fourth daughters, but not as deep as Yolanda for sure. I also read that book critics have said that Yolanda is an autobiographical character for Julia Alvarez, which I could believe, seeing how in-depth it goes into her character, and also hearing a little bit about Julia Alvarez's life, moving back and forth between the countries and the reasons why. After that Yolanda chapter, the very first chapter, I did have this expectation that the book would begin and then from there it'd be the chronological story of why they moved to the US, how they got acclimated, and just see how everything's going to be. But the book never really got to that point where it's like, okay, now we're starting, here's little girls, here's who they are, and then went through like the traditional bell curve as I was mentioning. But in some way I did kind of like that because it allowed us to see just the important defining moments in the Garcia the family's life. And you definitely don't have to worry about being bored in this book because you're not gonna feel like, okay, I'm waiting during this period of time for the action that I know is gonna come. Because it's all just action. <laughs> Each chapter has its own action, its own climax. But also another way, having the book go backwards kind of helped me not to get so emotionally invested <laughs> in this story. Like I'm still thinking about this book that I read in Spanish. It was really frustrating <laughs> at the end because the bad character got her way and uh, 
it was so frustrating. <laughs> and this sort of story, that can be a fault, but it can also be a good thing <laughs> for people like me who get too emotionally invested because it helped me from doing that. I was like, okay, this is how their lives are. This is how it turns out. And then let me find out their steps to getting there, how they were as kids and what the move was like. So it was kind of like a good thing for me. It kept me from getting disappointed when things didn't turn out how I had hoped. Another thing I wanted to note, this book is written in English. I mean, there is some Spanglish parts, obviously. And there was times when I was more curious than confused, but I just really wanted to know, is this conversation happening in Spanish or in English? Because there were some points where it was written in Spanish, but they Mentioned. They would write a phrase or a sentence in Spanish during a conversation, but it was mostly written in English and all the conversations were in English, whether or not they were happening in the US or in the DR with an English speaking person or a Spanish speaking person. But seeing as parts of this book do take place in the DR, I was curious. I know they're trying to teach their kids English and some of them are fluent in English, but as a bilingual person, I was curious, is this happening in Spanish or in English? I can imagine that some of those conversations transpired in Spanish, although I know that at least the mother was fluent in English before they moved to the US, and it's possible they could have been speaking in English. Anyways, that's just a curiosity that I had as a bilingual person, but it's not a big deal. <laughs> it doesn't affect my understanding of the book, although I did enjoy some of the Dominicanismos of the book, how I would say, throw in like a Dominican phrase, or just a normal Spanish phrase. All in all, my rating of this book, I would give it an 8 out of 10. It does a great job of holding your attention. I easily finished it within this past week. I had other things to do, I'm not like that crazy. <laughs> not reading books, but I did finish it within the week. And it definitely leaves you wanting more, anticipating the next chapter, the next step in their lives. But at the same time, it is easy to, to pause and put down because each of the chapters is kind of its own story. So you get to the end of the chapter, you can be like, okay, I don't know what's gonna happen in the next chapter. I'm not anticipating anything because it's going back in time. So it can be easy to put down in that sense. The only reason I'm taking off a couple points is because I am kind of a traditionalist. It is fun to sort of follow the emotional drive of the story and the climax and the conflict and the resolution. And since the story doesn't have that, as I mentioned, does have it for each chapter, I kind of almost felt directionless. Like I wasn't sure where I was going and how it was gonna end. And even at the ending, it wasn't like a happily ever after sort of ending, which I know not every book needs, but as I mentioned, it is nice to be able to tie neat little bows on things. <laughs> But that's not a bad thing for a lot of people. That book doesn't need that. It doesn't need a happy landing. It was still a good book. I really liked it. As I mentioned, I'm giving it an 8 out of 10. One thing I don't like a lot of books is like vulgar stuff. So there wasn't a lot of that. Not as much as the brief wonders they about Oscar Well. So I will say if you really want a story that's like, okay, we're starting here. Here's the setting. Here's all the characters. Now here's the conflict. Now here's the climax. As I mentioned, if you want the typical plot with a dramatic moment and all of that. You're not really going to get that with this book, but it is a beautiful look into the experience of a family who had to immigrate after living under the dictatorship and what it was like for people who were trying to overthrow him and just see how someone coming from a different country to the US might feel living here trying to either maintain their roots to maintain their native language and culture or just assimilate into the American culture and English language. One aspect that I do feel like Julia Alvarez does really well is telling about the world from the perspective of a child. There's so many things she wrote that I just really appreciated. Even in the addendum at the end, which tells more about her life, there is a quote I really liked on page 299. She's just really good at accurately portraying the confusion of the world as a child. You see things as one way, and it's, it's funny because you can relate to that, even if it's not something you believed as a child. It's something that makes sense why a child would think that. <laughs> like, your parents say something that makes you think a crazy thing. Like, anyway, I'll, I'll give an example. She says, It took some time before I understood that Americans were not necessarily a smarter, superior race. It was as natural for them to learn their mother tongue as it was for a little Dominican baby to learn Spanish. It came with mother's milk, my mother explained. And for a while, I thought a mother tongue was a mother tongue because you got it from your mother's breast along with nutrients and vitamins. It's just like one of those funny things where like, yeah, it made sense that a child would say that if their mother told them that. Now I'm going into some of my favorite quotes of the book. That was one at the very end. As I mentioned, this is sort of like the note from the author. So first of all, let me get into my first favorite quote was pretty early in the book. Page 12, this is from Yolanda's perspective when she was in the Dominican Republic. This is what she has been missing all these years without really knowing that she has been missing it. Standing here in the quiet, she believes she has never felt at home in the States. Never. Next, I want to go to page 13. This quote simply says, What language, he asked, looking pointedly into her eyes, did she love in? An interesting quote. Third favorite quote is, Above them, the sky is purple with twilight. The sun breaks on the hilltops, spilling its crimson yolk. Just a beautiful picture of the sunrise. Or sunset. I don't remember. 
So that was part one. There's three parts of this book. And as I mentioned, it goes backwards. Part one is from 1989 to 1972. That's more of their adult lives. Part two is from 1970 to 1960. So you can see how they go backwards. And part three is from 1960 to 1956. So even earlier when they were even younger kids. All right, next part. I didn't write down another quote until I was in part three. They are coffee with milk color and the khaki they wear is the same color as their skin. So they look all beige, which no one would ever pick as a favorite color. <laughs> I just thought that was funny because there's that whole trend now of like the sad beige kids. And it says right here, which no one would ever pick as their favorite color. No one can actually like that color. <laughs> like sure, I mean it looks nice a lot of things, but if that's your favorite color, like I'm sorry. Next favorite. This one was funny because it was from the perspective of an American in the DR. It said, the chairs in his study bear the logo from their alma mater, Yale, which Vic notes the family mispronounces as jail. <laughs> I can definitely imagine that in a really good accent. Next part from page 248. Next favorite quote. I really liked this description from Sandy. Again, it's from the perspective of a child. So she says, I could see these art lessons were not going to be any fun. It seemed like everything I enjoyed in the world was turning out to be wrong. I had recently begun catechism classes in preparation for my first communion. The Catholic sisters at Our Lady of Perpetual Sorrows Convent School were teaching me to sort the world like laundry into what was wrong and right, what was venial, what, if you died in the middle of enjoying, would send you straight to hell. Before I could ever get to my life, conscience was arranging it all like a still life or tableau. But that morning in Doña Charito's house, I was not ready yet to pose as one of the model children of the world. Next quote that I really liked was on page 279. This is the description of someone else. The description goes, the face itself had been spared. It was uniformly brown, the brown skin so smooth that it looked as if it had been ironed with a hot iron. Only around the eyes where the tip of the iron couldn't get to were their wrinkles from smiles. Just three more. I love cats, so I just had to include this cat quote. <laughs> Immediately, I singled out one who had four little white paws and a white spot between its ears, fully dressed so it looked, as opposed to the others who were careless and had lost their shoes and their caps. This one, a curiosity, was the one I intended for me. I have always dreamed of just finding a kitten and just adopting it. That would be great. Next, this one is also from Yolanda's perspective, as was the last one. At that time, my natural lore was comprised of a few rules, all of which I confused, so that when the situation presented itself, I knew there was something to be done, but I did not quite know what exactly. If it was lightning, I was either to stand under a tree or in an open field so the tree wouldn't fall on me. If I found a nest of nightingale eggs or chicks, I was not to disturb it or the mother would abandon her roost and the chicks would die. But was it chickens or kittens? I wasn't sure. Just one of those things where it's like, yeah, being a kid, you get all these things confused and you worry. I don't know what to actually do in the moment. <laughs> Next quote, this is like the same page, what I said. Mamita wouldn't know anything about the outdoors, which she was allergic to, she claimed, which was why she had to go on shopping trips to New York, where, she said, the outdoors wasn't really outdoors, a riddle I promised myself someday to solve. So funny. <laughs> and then at the end of the book, it's like, I solved the riddle of how New York is outdoors, but not outdoors. Spoiler alert. <laughs> now let's talk about some discussion questions. This video might be really long, so I might only talk about a few of them, but they are good food for thought. These ones are in the back of the book. There's a reading and discussion guide here. The first question is basically asking, how does telling the story in reverse affect how you relate to the Garcia family members? And why do you think Alvarez chose this way of structuring her immigration story? How does it help you as a reader to understand the immigrant experience? Reading the story in reverse, I mean, as it's told, which is in reverse, it helps me to relate to the characters because it introduces them as adults with all the complexities of their lives already behind them. And it sort of piqued my own curiosity and made me want to learn more about what shaped them growing up and how they got to the point now where they are at the beginning. I think the author chose this because the memories of the Dominican Republic when the girls are little are all the way in the back of the book. They're the farthest away, both in the book and in their memories, and it sort of reflects that. You're just going back in time, you're going to the farthest point away from where they are now how those memories of the place where they're from can be kind of faint. So it kind of helps us understand how far immigrants can feel from their native country, their native tongue, when they immigrate to the US and even try to forget that culture. So number two, I did have a quick comment on that question. It basically says, when Yolanda returns to the Dominican Republic after a five year hiatus, she identifies herself as American. And I just had a quick comment. Seeing her identify herself as American was funny because 
my husband has said this to me, but like when Dominicans go to the US, they're all proud that they're Dominican and then when they come back to the DR, it's like, oh, we're proud that we went to the US so now we're Americans. I think it's very realistic of her to call herself American, especially since she was speaking English a lot, even to Dominican Spanish speakers. And number three, there's this quote that the father usually says. Papi says, good bulls sire cows. And it's sort of asking about how does he explain his feelings of having only daughters? And does it change when his daughter Sophia gives birth to Carlos, his first grandson? Is there a gender bias in Latin culture? I definitely think in a lot of places in the world there's a preference for male sons, male heirs, people to carry on the family name. And maybe even parents can be more lenient on male children, but I don't know if that's exclusively a Latin American thing. I've heard it also in Asian cultures, especially in China with the one child rule. I'm not going to talk a lot about that one. <laughs> Number four is asking about how the different narrators affected my reading of the book and how I related to each of the characters, how you relate to each of the characters. I feel like I could relate to Yolanda a lot because they just were simply sharing a lot more of her experience, but I also related to Carla's bits as well as the oldest daughter myself. I can sort of see that trying to keep everyone in line sense in her and the way she tries to sort of rally them or make amends to keep peace and try and do the right thing, be a good example. I can see a lot of that and relate to her because of that. Number five, the girl's mother, Mommy, says, I want to forget the past. Do you think the Garcias can ever forget the past? What role does memory play in how we adjust to lost homelands, cultures, and languages? Yeah, I think it'll be difficult to forget the past, but I think it does play a role in how we adjust to a new homeland if we are moving to a new place. I'm not gonna talk a lot about all of these. Number eight is saying the book has a lot of humor, including the girls' nicknames, their color-coded clothing, and Mommy's mixed-up idioms. For example, it takes two to tangle. How do these humorous passages juxtapose with the gravely serious story of Poppy being involved with a coup to overthrow the Dominican dictator? It helps keep the book light. It helps you feel like you're not just reading a tragedy. <laughs> Number nine, at one point in the novel, Sandy says, I've heard so many versions of that story, I don't know which one is true. What do her words say about how the girls, mommy and poppy, tell their stories? Can there be only one truth to a story? Is there a distinction being made between factual truth and emotional truth? This one I think is interesting because I think it's relatable to a lot of people. At least for myself personally, I feel like there's a lot of stories that I heard from parents or people older than me, and they're about myself, but I don't really remember that. Then eventually it becomes my own story and I start to tell it to like whether it's my husband we're exchanging memories. It does sort of change with time. You can feel like you actually remember it eventually. <laughs> Even though you realize, I don't think I remember this, I think it's just a story I saw in a picture or someone told me about myself. I definitely think people can have their own versions of a story. There can be the emotional sense of what was felt in that moment, whether it's anxiety or excitement. And then there's the factual truth, what actually happened versus the lens someone was seeing it through because of their emotions. The last question is also very interesting. It's asking, at the end of the book, which of the four Garcia girls do you think feels the most successful? Which daughter do you think Poppy considers and Mommy considers their most successful? It's hard to say because, as I mentioned, the book does not go in chronological order. and It's not like there's an end of the book wrap-up where it's like, this is what each one is doing with their lives, their relationship status, or anything like that. So it's hard to really say, but I think for all of them, there's a door open. And I think that's true for a lot of people in real life. We we always have the door open, we always have room to grow, and we're always a work in progress, looking to improve and learn new things, try new things, get a new job, start a new relationship or something. But I do feel like I got a good grasp on a lot of their current situations. I know the last daughter had the two kids. That could be a success in a sense for someone who wants to start a family. So maybe that's her personal definition of success or the fathers or the mothers. It's hard to really say which one would be the most successful in the parents eyes because I don't feel like I got a good grasp on the other ones. Especially ending or starting the book with Yolanda's perspective visiting the DR and hearing about how she never really felt at home in the states. It was interesting to see how she was kind of opening that door in herself back up to feeling Dominican again or relearning her Dominican identity. I think it's a good thing to all I know in the book is playing games in my mind started like that but that's the last chronological thing that happened and it's good to be reminded of that we always have a chance to relearn something or try something new and go a different direction. I think it's a good thing to continue thinking about where do I feel at home, what do I want to do with my life, what is my definition of a success. With that I'm going to conclude this review because I know it's been going on for a long time. If you've made it this far thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Let me know if you know any other Dominican American authors. I mean I've googled it, I've looked at more books I could read but let me know if you have any recommendations and always open to personal recommendations. I had fun doing this. It was like a mini English class <laughs> and I'm really looking forward to reading In the Time of the Butterflies. As I mentioned, I'll try to do a review of that book as well. I'm excited to learn more about Dominican history from that book since it was set even before this book. With that, I'll conclude. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a great rest of your day 
and I'll see you in the next one.